You have found Authentic Business Adventures, the business program that brings you the struggle stories and triumphant successes of business owners across the land. Coming to you typically from the Sun Prairie Community Studios, underwritten by Bank of Sun Prairie. Unfortunately, the world's falling apart, so we are each collectively <laughs> in our offices. My name is James Kademan, and I'm an entrepreneur, author, speaker, and helpful coach to small business owners across the country. Today, we're welcoming slash preparing to learn from Matt Couplin, the president and CEO of Midwest Financial Group. So Matt, how's it going today? Good. I uh, appreciate you figuring out a way to make this, uh, make this work, even though things are a little odd right now. Yeah, it's just, it's a weird, weird world to navigate now. So we just we work it out. It's not ideal. I much prefer in person. I imagine you do too. Just, yeah, it, I mean, with anything, it's a conversation. What I do, you know, with people, and just is yeah. what you're doing right here, and and you know, it's there's a different energy when you can't be in the same room as somebody. But I think it's pretty amazing that we've so quickly adapted to this sort of new fair. normal or temporary normal. Uh, because I don't think if this happened ten years ago, I, I'm not sure, you know, how <laughs> how that would have transitioned, you know, or it was five years ago, ten years, definitely fifteen years ago. Right. So there'd be a lot of phone calls and I imagine those would be even clumsier than what we're dealing with, with things like this. Right. I was, right. Just, I was just in a zoom meeting this morning and people didn't mute themselves. And there's one person that was essentially presenting and so you <laughs> heard phones going off and people coughing and some guy eating his breakfast. <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, there, there's some pretty funny, uh, you know, YouTube videos of those types of, of scenarios. You know, I think everybody's been in one when they're on a call like that. And now you amplify that with the dogs barking in the background, right. the kids are walking in the room, yeah. you know, whatever else it might be. Um, yeah, the office setting was sterile enough and it, it didn't work all that well. So now people calling in from home just right. compounds that even more. <laughs> just make it worse. So enough of that. This will be over hopefully soon. <laughs> I'm banking yep, on yep, it. Yep, for sure. Anyways, yep. why don't you tell us what Midwest Financial Group does? Like, just what is it? Uh, How long have you been doing it? Yeah, so I'm a uh, second generation leadership of the of the firm. Um, we're a, a values based financial planning and employee benefits firm. Uh, we have offices in Madison and Horicon, Platteville, actually two offices in Madison now. Um, but oh, the wow. firm was started by, yeah, yeah, we, the firm was started. Uh, 25 years ago or so, uh, Mark Meehy uh, was the owner and founder, and, and he started by selling um, health insurance to farmers out of the trunk of his car. I mean, just oh, a really? very modest, yeah, very modest beginning. Um, I met Mark in 2007 when I uh, came up to Madison from where I lived back in Illinois and was introduced to him. and. Um, hit it off with him. And, and he said, Hey, you know, at that time he had a secretary and him, and that was really it. Um, oh. And he was looking to grow and find someone younger to, to step in and maybe someday take over the firm. And so now about 10 years later, um, I became an owner. And then, you know, a couple of years ago, took over the full role of running things. But we, oh. um, we help individuals and business owners, um, as well as, as uh, businesses in terms of helping their employees with everything from financial planning, investments, group insurance products, individual insurance products, uh, Medicare supplement, all sorts of types of things. So, um, and I guess our, our big, you know, saying you're a financial advisor is sort of like saying you're a doctor. I mean, you could you could use that title and be a professor, a heart surgeon, or a chiropractor, and you, sure. you're all doctors, but you don't do the same thing necessarily. Right, not even close. Right, exactly. Um, and so for us, same thing, financial advisor, financial professional, what does it mean exactly? And we're uh, a planning-based company, so whether uh, you're an individual client or a business owner or whether you're um, you know, looking for, for to take care of employee groups. We start with forming a plan and then products and other things like that come secondary. So it, it, the, the basics is trying to, to sit and listen and put together sort of a blueprint that you can then go and execute on and, um, you know, kind of serves as a guidepost that you update periodically. Uh, and I think that that recently, especially with everything that's going on in the economy and the markets and to small business owners all over, yeah. Um, I think having a, a plan like that has been very comforting. Sure. That sounds super cool. So when you first started, what was the, what was the area that you started in? Was it health insurance or life insurance or the stocks and bonds, 401k stuff, part of it? 
So I came in uh, fully licensed to be able to help with individuals and their insurance, so health and life and disability. Um, and then also came in fully licensed to be able to help someone with individual investment planning. Oh, you did? Um, okay, and you see the whole gamut. I did, but I, but I was uh, I was 25. I was brand new to Wisconsin, and I knew absolutely nobody. All right. Uh, so that that was a challenge, right? I mean, to sit down um, in front of somebody else in 2008 when the market that year was having a very difficult uh, time, um, and try to win over and convince them that I knew what I was talking about was uh, an uphill battle to say the least. But sure. um, if you can get through that and still be, you know, two or three years in the industry, um, that that's kind of a, a magic watermark for us. A lot of people use that. If you can survive those first few years, typically, you know, you can make a, a good career from this type of work. And sure. those were those were lean years. I would often like joke with my wife. I'm like. You know, are you okay if we have to live in a cardboard box? And she's like, well, as long as like we splurge for like a like a double wide fridge one, or maybe like one of the bigger. Uh, <laughs> so, but we made it, and um, and so eventually over time, I refined my focus and became more niche focused with the investment planning and wealth management. Um, but yet, brought on people to our team because now we've got you know 14 or 15 employees, and I said if you know a couple different locations, and so now we've got specialists that help implement the planning that I do and others do so sure. that everyone sort of has their role. Nice. So when you were first getting certified in all that jazz, what made you decide to get into this field? Uh, that's a really good question, actually, because I, I had no real intention. So I, I, I graduated um, from Western Illinois University with a bachelor's in business marketing and then stayed there for two years to get my master's in sports business, Oh, which totally unrelated to anything I'm doing right now. Sure. I was an athlete, loved sports, liked business, thought, okay, if I could marry all those things together, wouldn't that just be a great profession? Sure. Um, grew up a Cubs fan, but my first job out of college was for the Brewers. Uh, okay. So, <laughs> yeah, I moved, I moved north uh, and, and lived in Waukesha for a little bit out of grad school and was working for the Milwaukee Brewers in their corporate marketing department. Um, but at the same time, um, my, my parents who had, who had been divorced, uh, for quite some time, um, my mom was on her own, um, and she was battling cancer. And so I left my position in Milwaukee to go down and be with her and try to support her and be able to take her to and from treatments and different things like that. Sure. And one day when I came home, she goes, you know, hey, Matt, I just want you to be aware of, of my finances and I'm going to, you know, maybe put you in charge of some decision making if I ever can't make those decisions. So I want you to sit down with my financial advisor. And so we sat down at her kitchen table with him and he sort of inquired on what I was up to now that I was back home. And I said, well, yeah, I'm, I'm, I've got two degrees and, and no job kind of looking for work. And he's like, oh, well, we're going to have a recruitment meeting over in Rockford. You know, you get a free dinner. Sure. And as soon as he said free dinner, I was in. Because at that point, like, you know, there, <laughs> there, that didn't take too much to persuade me to go to sure. something at that point. Sure. So I went, went over to that and it was, uh, it was uh, the company was Thrivent Financial. And uh, I, I really liked the idea that, you know, they, um, the, as it was presented to me, financial planning and, and things like that, we're really focused on trying to help people and solve, you know, needs and very flexible. And, and the, the more, the harder you're willing to work, the more prosperous you could be uh, the more mm -hmm. people you could help. Sure. And then also it gave me the flexibility to be able to take my schedule and free up time to be with my mom and do stuff like that. Gotcha. So that's how I got into it. Unfortunately, it was only about a year after doing that, that my mom passed. And oh, so, sorry. Yeah, they, it was nice that I was able to be home and closer for all that. Sure. So when that all played out and I did everything that I needed to do to sort of take care of any loose ends there, um, I reached out to a friend from school, from college, and he was working up in Wisconsin being an advisor. And he connected me with, with Mark, who I mentioned earlier. And, and I said, all right, well, there's not a whole lot keeping me back home right now. And I looked at my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife and said, Hey, you know, you want to move to Madison? <laughs> and so we did. 
and we've never looked back and so now yeah now we've got a new home that we built and three kids and and there's the roots are firmly planted sure nice so your experience with that financial planner with your mom was he or she easy enough to work with or were you thinking like oh my gosh i could totally do this better than you <laughs> uh, he, he was great. Uh, he, he'd been a part, I mean, he, he'd been a part of my family's, uh, planning for a long time. I mean, I didn't, looking back, I can now see, uh, how much he was there, you know, at the time I occasionally would be brought in on, into a conversation because I needed to sign this or do that or be aware sure. of this. But, um, you know, they had, my mom was, was well set up for her situation meaning you know she had insurance uh, life insurance before she was sick she had she had investments so that when my parents split up you know amicably still she could support herself and my dad was in a, a good spot too you know and so they there was a lot of value that uh was transferred there and i, I don't think i really understood or, or appreciated it until after i took a couple you know years of walking in those shoes but sure. um but yeah, definitely very much. He was, uh, he was a large help for, and, and he also, when she passed, he was great about continuing that help and support and, you know, and, uh, he, I guess he had no obligation necessarily to do that besides moral and ethical. Sure. And, and he, he did great. Okay. Very cool. Very cool. So is there a favorite part of your business that you've been working with so far between all of the options that you that you offer? I mean, there's all the insurance, the, the financial planning broadly, there's the basic investments and stuff like that. That's pretty big. Play yeah. Well, it, well, and that's where I think that the more that we built out the, the business, the more we've been able to find people who really excel in certain areas. Um, for me, um, I, I like more of the touchy feely stuff, you know, sure. so I like, I like the client interactions. I like the client messaging, the marketing, the branding, mm -hmm. um, and then I, and then the analytical side of me likes the, des, the design of a plan. Sure. Um, whereas my partner, Brandon, uh, he, he really gets into the numbers of the investments and crunching, you know, all of, all of those types of things. And, and so, uh, as well as some of the, the book working and some of that type of stuff too, you know, budgeting and things like that for the business. And, um, it's worked out really well that, that, uh, the yin and the yang there, because the things that, that I gravitate towards, are things that he would just as soon I gravitate towards and uh, uh -huh. vice versa. So sure. you don't always get that lucky with your, with, uh, with your business partners, but uh, no. I've been very fortunate in that regard. Sure. So let's talk about the whole business and you coming on board with, with Midwest financial, you were with Thrivent and then you made the switch or how did that work? Um, so when I, I, well, I mean, I was, I was technically with them. Um, I was part of their training program, which, which was such that I could, uh, they afforded me a little bit of an income to mm -hmm. start because I, I had no clients. And back then it was, you know, the only way you got paid was to, was to sell something. Um, well, and so it, pretty much after a certain point, you know, sure. and they, so they gave you a little bit of a ramp up and then mm -hmm. they expected you to start, you know, working with people and, and getting life insurance policies sure. in place and, you know, finding new uh, investments and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I was only, I wasn't there long enough to really build up much of a clientele because everything happened fairly quickly after um, I sure. joined with them. Mm -hmm. And then when I moved to Madison to, you know, I, I knew at the time that I didn't want to stay back there. So I, I looked and I put my name, uh, I mean, I probably could have went four or five different places to continue doing what I was doing, just not in that area. Sure. Um, and just, you know, when I met Mark and, and had an instant, uh, uh, he was very sincere and genuine. And, and I felt that if I was going to do any, and he also laid out a little bit different approach. Mm -hmm. So I was accustomed to a big corporation, Thrivent, and okay. a sales culture where you needed to sell things. And sure. not that the not that the client was second, but if you wanted to stay employed, the sale was first. Uh -huh. You know. All right. Um. So you know, and and not to say that you shouldn't be, not to say the things that we were selling back then weren't important because they were, but I didn't. It didn't mesh with what I thought I was getting myself into, and sure. then when I came and, and sort of heard 
what it was like to be an independent business owner who operated in this space versus working for a bigger corporation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think that that resonated more with me because it allowed me to do more more planning and things like that. So I had no restrictions when I moved up here of, of who I could or couldn't talk to. Thrivent was very gracious given my situation to to not try to, you know, put any sort of uh, restrictions on me to be sure. able to leave. Sure. Um, and then I just, I worked a lot, a lot of hours for quite a few years, just trying to meet and talk to anybody and, and build my knowledge and, and ask the right questions. And I, I, sh I had a great mentor, you know, was sitting in with, uh, with Mark in the meetings was, you know, fast tracked my education in this industry and sure. got to know his clients as he slowly would pass them off and I would find my own. And it just, I learned really early on that if you just do one thing every day, mm -hmm. It, you know, one becomes two, becomes four, becomes eight, becomes 16. I mean, there's a compounding sure. effect, but you need to do, you know, every day I made a note on my calendar, like, okay. And I would write down what it was that day. You know, did I pick up the phone and call a prospect? Did I think of a marketing idea? Did I go knock on a door? Did I send a, a thank you note? Like w one thing every day to make sure that I was continuing to take more steps. And then eventually sure. that just became like breathing. And I found myself doing more things every day than just that one thing. All right. All right. So do you, the, let's talk about the sales aspect of it. Cause the sales thing, I guess you and I both know a lot of people that are in sales selling all different manner of things. And it's gotta be tough selling, let's say for example, life insurance. Cause you're essentially selling a promise that you hope you don't have to keep. <laughs> kind of, right? right. Yeah. You're, <laughs> that's, that's sort of the rub with that. Right. I mean, you hope that no one ever has to cash in on it. Although we know, we all know that at yeah. some point and right. no one gets out alive, but, we but you're hoping do, during right? the years that, you know, but I think that's where, you know, you can, you could sell something like that based on, okay, here's, here's a good product or here's a good price or here's a good uh, company or whatever. Yeah. Um, and you're going to, if if you're a salesman or a saleswoman, you could probably sell it. You know what I mean? Period. End of story. It's a product. You sold it. You sure. you could add, add, add any widget and you could sell the widget. Right. Right. I think for, for, to, to really do well in, in this industry, whether it's the insurance side or the financial services side or whatever it is, you're selling yourself, you're, you're selling, you're selling a solution that they may or may not know that they need, you know, you're, you're right. trying to help them, you know, you don't buy life insurance cause you're going to get a check from it. You're going to, you buy it because your wife or your husband or your children, I mean, right. you have to really put it in that perspective. And, and I think most people, when they, when they view it that way, will look at it different than it's a product-based decision, sure. you know? Um, so I think you, you have to be able to, to resonate with people. And at the end of the day, you know, there's, there's a lot of people in, in this industry and people can choose to work with a lot of different people. And I think that they ultimately gravitate towards someone that they feel is, is genuine and sincere. And mm -hmm. I think it's a lot easier to come across genuine when you don't come in trying to sell something and instead come in trying to present a plan. And part of the, the, you know, the, and once you get into agreement, yeah, that plan makes sense. Okay. Well, to, implement this plan we need abc and xyz mm -hmm. sure and then it becomes very more matter of fact versus feeling like you've just been sold some product sure gotcha so i guess i'm going to go off a tangent here if you're cool with that yeah go for it uh life insurance is one of those things that i have a tough time wrapping my head around because i've been told a lot of things by a lot of different people i imagine anybody has um sure we've got term we have other things which my mind is blank <laughs> permanent whole permanent, life uh, universal uh, yeah yeah, yeah there's, all sorts, there's, yep. there's just this um i guess the more people i talk to the more they come up with fancy little products that it's like the new and improved life insurance or something like that so yep. knowing that you're not directly selling anyone that's listening or watching even can you just yep. give us a lowdown on just life insurance 101 yeah i think there's a couple uh there, there's a couple of key forks in the road, right? So the big, the big fork in my opinion would be term insurance versus permanent insurance. And so okay. term insurance, um, you could think of that more like your homeowners or a car or something like that, where, you know, if, if you're, if you don't crash your car or, or if your house doesn't, doesn't burn down, you don't get any of your money back, but you had protection had it happened. Sure. Term, term is that same way where for a certain term, certain period of time, they will agree to keep the contract in force as long as you pay the premium. 
Okay. They won't raise the premium for that period of time. Sure. Um, and if you pass away during that period of time, you, you know, th there's a death benefit, a tax-free death benefit to your beneficiaries. Okay. So, and because that, because it's, it's pretty straightforward like that, it's typically the lowest cost option because at the end of it, if you bought, if you bought it for 20 years and you live past those 20 years, you don't typically get any money back or anything sure. like that. Sure. There are some different features that you can add on, but for the most part, that's how it works. It's, mm -hmm. it's sort of the, you know, the, the low cost solution that, um, that we would recommend to people maybe if they were, you know, um, just purely wanting that, like, Hey, I've got a young family. I've got a mortgage for some odd years. I just want an affordable way where if I'm not here anymore, that there's a check that's going to be there when I'm, when I'm not. Sure. Um, and so that's one key component. The other side would be more of a permanent product. And that's where you get companies that come up with all sorts of variations of these different types of products. And sure. they all have their own spin on how it behaves. But the reason that there's all these variances is because there's a death benefit that you're purchasing, but then there's usually some sort of accumulation component to it as well. So okay. you could, you know, there's a pool of money that's building in there um, in some way, shape or form that's growing in some sort of manner that, you know, you could borrow against, or if you choose to, you know, if, if you, if you live to be 65 and the kids are launched and the house is paid for and you don't need it, the money, you know, anymore that uh, you might be able to, to turn in that policy, surrender that policy and take some cash back out of it type of thing. Sure. Um, and that's just put it put real, real simply. So that that's the big fork in the road. Obviously, if you're for the permanent insurance, your money is going towards the death benefit, just like mm -hmm. it is with term. Mm -hmm. But then there's also money going towards this pool that that this cash value. So it, sure. it would you know inherently it's going to be more expensive policy because there's more dollars going to more places than what a sure. term policy is. Gotcha. And what's right or wrong, you know, there's there's all sorts of, of, of debate and schools of thought, even right. within our industry. Um, I don't think any of them are inherently wrong or 100% right all the time. Sure. And I think that's what takes you back to, you know, okay, we got a plan in place. What are we trying to accomplish? You know, you know James, mm -hmm. maybe you want to, to have you know, this piece with cash in it, but you know, your, your sibling or brother or father or friend, you know, they just want straight coverage as low cost as they can so that someone's protected if they pass away. And you two might be very alike in mother regards, but your plans could be totally different. And so the nice part is gotcha. that there's those different solutions that you can try to match up. But okay. if, I think if anyone ever comes to you and just presents the solution first without knowing what it is that you're trying to do, that's when right. you sort of have to go, okay, hold on, you know, am I, am I being sold around. to or advised? Yeah. Sure. All right. That's fair. Let's talk about health insurance. Cause you guys sell health insurance. I know with, um, there's been some changes, I guess in the past yeah, yeah. Uh, decade ish. It was interesting. Cause I was reading this book. Um, oh my gosh, the name escapes me, but it was this guy, he's writing a book on, um, or he wrote a book, I should say, on just general broad business and he his company was remanufacturing engines for caterpillars like big construction equipment it's a really cool book but in it he was talking he was complaining about the price of health care and i was like oh my gosh i just got this book at the library for like a buck at their bookstore right and so i checked right. the copyright date and it was 1992. I'm like, oh my <laughs> gosh if this guy only knew like it doesn't right, get better right. <laughs> So no, I guess, it, can you just tell me how you guys navigate that? What are some of the changes that you've seen or had to deal with just from both the, the insurance side, but I know the commission side has also changed, right? Yeah. I, you know, the, the revenue that, you know, we've got a full-time person here on staff, uh, Scott, as well as mm -hmm. a couple other people that, that help with, with some of those things and, and me sitting at the top sort of looking at the numbers and how they come down. I mean, the, the amount of work that's being required by someone who is there providing, you know, the, the agent, um, versus, you know, has, has went up, uh, quite a bit and oh, the amount is. of revenue that, yeah, that has generated, uh, has come down in, in my opinion, if you're, if you're really going to try to, to match somebody up with the right provider, if you, sure. if you work for ABC company and that's all that you do, and that's all that you're going to recommend to somebody, it's not so hard, but if you're independent, like we are, and you're trying to figure out, uh -huh. you know, in this, in this County or in this marketplace, what might be best 
it it does because you know some of the new reforms from from the Affordable Care Act, um, and then there were some things that were grandfathered and some things that weren't, and then some things that were grandfathered that were extended their grandfathering and sure. weren't, and um, it, it's a lot. And from year to year, you don't know. You know, you, you'll you get about a six to eight week head up heads up on what the next year's premiums are going to be. So how do you, wow. you, you get a, a, a huge rush of people at the end of the year, oftentimes who are looking to renew and they don't know if they, what they're looking at on the other side. Sure. So it, it becomes a, a, a very taxing end of the year for a lot of people in that regard. Yeah. And so, you know, I think the affordable care act um, was, was thought up of in with great intention and I don't know if in application, I think even if you would you talk to people who, you know, who maybe were part of that initial wave of push for that, um, they would even tell you that it, it hasn't totally rolled out the way that they would have liked to have seen it. And that sure. could be a lot of different people's faults if you want to place blame. But right. I think that it is good that, that we've got some things that, that are included in that. But it, it's also been very challenging for in, insurance companies and and for providers to figure out how to navigate that, how to price it. And then that's caused, especially at first, it caused huge spikes in a lot of people's um, premiums. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that was an unintended consequence of, of some of that. Sure. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. That had to be a tough, I don't know. I'm just picturing you're in this business, you're doing all right. And then this legislation passes and you're like, wait, what? <laughs> what um, yeah we i mean we weren't even sure if, if yeah the need for us was going to be there anymore you know sure. was it because you know you can go online and you can you can more or less just go enroll in a plan i mean if you've got a group plan through work it's one thing right and then mm -hmm. then someone like scott or whoever your company has as their contact person will come sure. in and help you get enrolled but if you're an individual or a small business owner and you have to go out and secure this coverage on your own or for a or, you know a smaller group of employees um, it can be a lot to navigate and, and, and it can be quite expensive. I mean, I would say, you know, I don't think I'm talking out of turn here. If, if I were to tell you that, you know, coverage for my wife and our three kids is almost like another mortgage, you know, yeah. and that's yeah. just to, to be healthy. If we get sick, then we still have to pay money. So, no, you, you know, I it, totally understand. Where it's you're tough. Coming from. Yeah. It's tough, you know, and cause we being a small business, uh, we can't spread that that cost over you know a, a thousand employees and help bring right. everybody's price down. We right. it just isn't feasible. Right. No, I completely understand where you're coming from. It's a it's a problem that I feel like every time I listen or read about politics going, let's call it 50 years back, it's been a problem for that long that just no one seems to be. I don't know. No one has the answer. So it's got to be a challenge no, for them it, to be in the middle of it like that. Yeah, and unfortunately, I think the, the, the reform focused more on, on insurance versus healthcare costs, Agreed. which I think, you know, that, that also makes it difficult because they, they allowed everyone to get coverage and they allowed people to pre-exist and to get coverage and a lot of great things. Mm -hmm. But yet, you know, you can go and if you ask, you know, your doctor how much a procedure is going to be, they don't honestly know. And, you know, right. or if, if you get an itemized bill, you just paid $50 for a box of Kleenex, you know, right. and, and it's just, <laughs> there's things that, that, that also on the other side of the coin, I think, um, you know, when, when we're able to attack both sides of that problem, mm -hmm. um, which we've only really attacked one side, I think we'll right. be better off, but I, people much smarter than me are going to have to figure out how to do that. So right. totally agree. Totally agree. So let's talk about investments. You guys work with a lot of people to try to build up their wealth so that they can retire someday, right? This yep, idea yep. To build up so that you have time and money at the same time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Have one Don't run out of one other. before you run out of the other. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, I mean, like the, the market that we've been dealing with recently has been challenging, <laughs> I guess. So, I guess, can you just tell me about how you work with people, especially in times like this when I imagine there's a couple frantic phone calls? And just generally speaking, when it's not necessarily up or not necessarily down, but something more broad, like how do yeah. you, I guess, how do you help someone get from A to B, B, B in retirement, A, B in wherever they are now? Uh, I think you have to, um, you know, a large part of what we get compensated for, regardless of how we go about that, is um, behavioral management. Oh. Um, 
I, I think that, you know, that there's, there's certain people in my industry who are just wealth advisors. So all they do is they manage a portfolio. So their job is the X's and O's, and that's really what they focus on. And that's totally fine. Mm-hmm. And that's a component of what we do here. But like for us in this recent thing where we've had, you know, we've had historic market volatility, not that the market has has fallen more than it has in the past because it, it hasn't. I mean, the it just, it, it was it was faster. The fall was faster. And then obviously thanks to um, being, you know, virtual media and everything. I mean, it was just, it was in your face so much sure. more than maybe it was in, in previous instances or something oh, like yeah. this. Yeah. And that, that just weighs on people, even a logical person's emotions. And I think that um, we spend a lot of time and thankfully before this, had spent a lot of time with most of our clients talking about, you know, Hey, we have an approach and our approach, you know, really shouldn't, should get us through any sort of market cycle. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, let's take, let's take more of a, you know, we want, we want people to focus on what's important to them. So mm-hmm. there is that emotional side to it, but we yeah. want it then to be, to remove that emotion when it comes to what they're seeing going on on a statement from month to right. month. Right. And so that that's what becomes challenging um, is just getting people to sort of remove, uh, you know, focus their emotions on the right things and remove it from the things that, that they really, you know, shouldn't be focused on. Sure. Um, and I, I think we often use history as a guide for that. You know, there's a lot of clients we've worked with for a very long time and we can go back and say, hey, do you remember how you felt at this point or sure. that point? Do you remember that, you know, six months later, four months later, 12 months later, it was all water under the bridge. Right. And so I think we spent a lot of time, I, you know, I, we filmed a couple of videos that we sent out to clients to just, you know, try to reassure them that, that, um, that we're going to get through this and that we were here for them, that we cared and people want to be heard. I mean, I spent, uh, I would say I spent quite a bit of time in late February and most of March, um, as we sit here today on the 13th of April, mm-hmm. um, I, I spent a lot of that just listening to people. They just wanted to be heard. They just wanted sure. someone to tell them that it was going to be okay. Right. Um, and, and here we are, you know, already, uh, you know, a few weeks past what has so far been the bottom of this most recent market correction. And, you know, people are starting to see some different signs of hope, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's just, it's, it's reminding them when we go through this, that, that there's there's that side, but then there's opportunity, right? Sure. The market was just on sale, huge sale, <laughs> yeah. huge sale, mm-hmm. right? And mm-hmm. and and you don't you know you don't have anything when it comes to investments uh, until you go to spend it or use it, right? I mean the number right. on the paper is wonderful, but if you're not going to actually cash it out and use it, you don't really truly have it. That's fair. And that's very that's very good. This, yeah, it's the same on the up and the down, you know. Mm-hmm. So. I think it's just teaching people to to rethink their views on money and why and why they have it. If 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 your goal is just to have a, a a bigger number and that's all your goal is, I think that you'll never ever be happy. But sure. if you can strip that down and go, okay, well, I I want a bigger number because I want to retire. Well, why do I want to retire? Well, because I want to spend more time with my family. Okay, well, mm-hmm. you know, and, and you kind of you you go you go back down the list until you get to some of your core beliefs mm-hmm. and values and things like sure. that, and then you can see what what that is affording you to do. And then you can go, okay, well, here's what's really important. And if you go all the way back down the list, I still have my family, you know, hopefully I still have my health right now. You know, mm-hmm. I don't have 10% of my portfolio, but hold on. Like that's not really, that that will be there when I need it to be there if I've got right. a proper plan in place. Right. So. <clears throat> that's fair. That's totally fair. So let's downshift again into talking about you with the business specifically you were an employee and then you evolved into essentially being the owner or are you, are there partnerships still? Yep. So, uh, when I started and I was part of a, a previous owner, so I was an employee. Yep. I mean, you can pretty much call me a glorified intern, but I mean, I was, I was an employee <laughs> at that point. <laughs> um, and then I worked into an ownership structure, uh, a four person ownership structure, I don't know, probably 2012. And I was a, a real, I was a small, like, uh, I forget even how much it was, maybe 10 or 15% owner. Okay. We, the company got to a certain point where we sold a portion of it off and then that left a, a kind of an ownership structure change. And that, that was the change with Mark, uh, his wife, Chris Ann, 
um, and Jackie, another uh, business person here with us, um, and myself. And then eventually, the, the, the last and current and probably foreseeable arrangement, which we've had here for a couple of years now, is I took over fully for the husband and wife who were the primary owners. And so now um, I'm 75% owner. Uh, my partner, Brandon uh, and Jackie are also owners with me. So gotcha. okay. um, yeah, so it's it's a good mix. Uh, Jackie is sort of our, um, she's our guru. Our, she, she manages all the staff. She, she take, tackles all the complicated business questions and, and client questions um, that we have that come up that, that need a little extra handholding. So sure. she um, has the same licenses and everything that I do, but doesn't have the desire to be in the one-on-one -on -one meetings. Sure. Some people just, you know, that's not what they want to do. Mm -hmm. um, so she's very much back office. And then Brandon and I would be the advisors that are more, uh, more client facing as well as two other uh, advisors. So we have four, financial planners that are sure. actually client working. And then we've got people, you know, I mentioned Scott who does health insurance and a marketing yeah. director and some other support staff that are great. So, um, okay. yeah. Has it been tough? Well, let me back up a step. The partners that you have, have they been with the company as long or longer than you have? No. So I would have the longest tenure at this point. Um, my partner Jackie has been with us for quite a while and she started almost as a receptionist and then worked her way, you know, up the, in terms of her ability to help and do things and, sure. um, and pretty much made herself uh, invaluable. Um, and Brandon's been around now for, uh, for a handful of years as well. He had been in, in the industry in, in a different capacity sort of, and then joined with us. And, uh, like I mentioned earlier, um, a funny story. I mean, at first I, I absolutely just, uh, I couldn't stand him. We just, we were like oil and water. Uh, <laughs> and, awesome. and, and we, yeah, if he was here, I'd, I'd, I'd make fun of him and tell him that. But, uh, uh, we, we now, uh, you know, he's one of my best friends and, uh, and a great business partner to, to be with. So, sure. um, you know, it's just kind of crazy how some of those things, uh, evolve out of nowhere more or right. less. Right. Um, and what then before the you know, big, you look back uh, and it's been a few years. What was the personality conflict initially? <laughs> was um, jokes or something? Or? I, I, no, no. He, um, he's a very disciplined, um, very, uh, he, he has a military background, very bright. Um, but I always joke that if there's a problem that's in front of us, Brandon would run through the wall and I would try to find a way to run around the wall. So <laughs> okay. our, that's fair. Our approach to get to the other side isn't always the same, um, sure. but yet we both get there. And I think that that's, uh, that, that is a, a nice compliment for us. And so uh, at first his, his personality in terms of how, you know, some of the suggestions he would make or things like that, um, they just would rub me the wrong way. And then we, we had a trip <laughs> that we had to take together to a conference sure. and we uh, hung out uh, for a couple nights and, and got to know each other outside of the office and, and loosened up a little bit that way and uh, never looked back. You know, it is weird how many people that I have met and talked to that somebody had rubbed them the wrong way and through some stroke of whatever, they ended up sitting down and having a beer out of just forced <laughs> or whatever, or just one person happened to be at the bar and they showed up and they just sat, whatever. And then after that moment that they shared a drink, it's all good. That it's yeah, I, I don't know if it's a, a common, uh, you know, common denominator or a leveling of the playing field or, or, or the defenses or whatever it was. But, yeah. Uh, but yeah, it wasn't, you know, um, certainly didn't go out thinking that was going to be the end outcome. In fact, probably sure. didn't even, you know, uh, want to go out to, for that matter. Um, <laughs> but very, very happy that it did. Sure. That's cool. That's very cool. So you, um, I imagine you have to find employees every once in a while including mm -hmm. some people that are, have to sell. So can you talk about that? Cause I imagine that's gotta be a tougher nut to crack. It is very difficult when, when, when the last ownership group sort of transitioned to us, we lost a couple advisors um, of, I mean, we lost our two senior advisors, you know, Mark and Chris Ann have been in the industry for decades and um, that left behind a lot of slack that Brandon and I had to pick up and to try. And we knew that, you know, we couldn't do it on our own. We had to find a couple more people and, you know, a couple, 18 months or so ago, I think we hired Eric and, and Kurt has been with us now for about six months. Um, and so when you, when you try to find, and that's just people that are more, more 
direct client facing, let alone the the support staff that also has yeah. to do things. But the the client facing folks, um, it's it's really it's really difficult because most people, if they're really good at what they're doing, if they're in this industry already, already and they're really good at what they're doing, it's difficult to try to entice anybody to want to leave unless there's some sort sure. of synergy that you could bring to the table and then there are sometimes you know if we've got we've got a really good system and a support staff maybe a person that's by themselves could come here and thrive with less effort Mm -hmm. um but you know it's it's difficult and then if you're if you come across someone who's not doing very well it's not to say that they're not good at what they do maybe they need some help but but you also have to wonder okay well why are you not successful are you not putting in the work are you not you know is is this just not your fit right so it, be- it becomes difficult. So we've, we've very quickly, or at least I think that we very quickly narrowed down people that we talk to that the common denominator typically is, is communication skills. So, gotcha. you know, if you, you know, oftentimes in, in an interview session or something like that, I, I mean, I'll ask questions that have nothing to do with, with our industry just to get somebody to talk about themselves. You know, can you, can you communicate well? Can you carry a conversation? Are you personable? Are you likable? Cause we've, every financial advising firm or practice probably has a method, a, a set of tools, the things that they use on a repeated basis. So and you can get mm-hmm. somebody to understand that and buy into that, but you can't necessarily make somebody a good conversationalist. Sure. I don't think, <laughs> you know, uh, or at right. least one that comes comfortable in their own skin. Right. And I think if everybody that we've had really good luck with, even our, our back office staff, you know, who maybe uh, only work on the phones more or less, Mm-hmm. Very polite, very respectful, very you know ethical. Can you know uh, very? If you if you met them out and bumped into them, you know at the store and you didn't know who they were and just had a conversation, you'd be like, oh, that was a nice person. Yeah. And I think that that goes a long way. The rest of it can all sort of learn, but it's it's tough. Hiring is is definitely one of the more challenging parts of being a business owner. Sure, that's fair. In every business that I've had, I've learned to hire for personality, and just. Uh, uh, just, I guess just personality and attitude really. And you can pretty much train almost everything else. So, well, in small businesses are, I mean, it's like a family. So, I mean, if you, you're getting to pick your family in this case, which you don't get to do in real life. So no. um, <laughs> well, if you're going to be, sur- yeah, right. If you're going to be surrounded by these people and, and, you know, culturally there has to be a fit and, and everything else. I mean, everyone's sort of got to be, got to be pointed in the same direction. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, that kind, of, that kind of goes back to the whole, you know, Brandon thing where at first I felt like we were sort of pointed in different directions, but then after yeah. we could sit down and talk, it, it was, we came at it different ways, but we were both pointed in the same direction. I think in a small business structure, you know, one bad apple, you know, you could have a whole lost year um, oh, yeah. just trying to deal with, with, with little silly stuff. Yeah. I've totally been there. I hated it. Like, totally <laughs> I think everybody has. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Huh. Um, you, we don't have a ton of time left here, but I know that you've been through a lot of stuff. And I think, I'm trying to think when I first met you, was this probably oh, you, 20, 20, 13 years ago? Oh, no, maybe not 13, 10 years Yeah, ago? you're one of the first people I think that I met when I, because when I joined, when I came up, I joined that B&I group that you and I were yeah. together. So you're one of the first people back in 08 or 09, yeah. probably, that I knew. That was a long time ago. Holy cow. Yeah, so right. <laughs> you've come a long way since then. So I imagine that you've learned a few things. So from a business side and just dealing with people and all that jazz. So can you tell me and listeners as well, what are some of the things that you have learned, I guess, life lessons, so to speak, or business lessons that you've learned that you wish you knew when you first started? Um, I think that there's work life balance as a small business owner, or mm-hmm. even before I was a business owner, um, you know, I, um, I was really driven um, and I probably didn't prioritize my wife who at the time was, you know, a girlfriend or fiance. Um, I didn't prioritize my health, you know, and, and staying, staying in shape, staying, staying, you know, uh, doing things like that. Um, it, it was okay. Let's, you know, let's figure out how to do this whole business thing. Let's get as good as I can. And I think, you know, with anything, balance, moderation, you know, is key. Um, and the same was, was probably true. And I think I was, I was weighted too far, um, one direction. Now, 
in looking back, is that why I'm, you know, in my late thirties and the owner of the firm and all that type of stuff? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Sure. But I know the stresses that it put on my body, you know, on my relationships, on different things like that. And if mm -hmm. I could have found a different way to do it in retrospect, I wish I, I would have. And I think now, um, it means easier to say that now because I'm sitting in the seat that I'm sitting in, but, right. um, I, I have a, a whole new value for, for that type of stuff. And I think sure. that, you know, that when you're a small business owner, um, or even a, you know, sole proprietor or, or just even anyone in the workforce, I mean, it becomes very easy to get your blinders on and try to get done what you want to get done. And anymore nowadays, as we've learned, you can work from almost anywhere or all yeah. the time. So you, right. you got to put in your, your, you know, your parameters to when you're going to turn that off. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think that, uh, I'm happy that I learned that now, but I, I wish maybe I could have done it a little bit differently in sure. retrospect. That is completely fair. Yeah. I totally understand that. What have been some of the mistakes that you've had to deal with along the way? Um, I don't know. <sighs> mistakes. I've definitely tried a lot of things that didn't work. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. but I don't know if that's a mistake or not. Um, no. well, you know, yeah, I, I guess it's all, I had to be, you know, thing, but yeah, you, you gotta, yeah. And you, you know, you gotta crack some eggs and make an omelet. Right. And there's mm -hmm. some eggs I dropped, I'm sure along the way that I sure. could have, you know, done differently. Um, uh, well, let's say some of the Probably. challenges that you've had to deal with besides this whole COVID thing, right? Because that's, right. <laughs> that's one that we didn't really see coming, I guess. No, I and... Yeah, no, I, I think uh, just probably um, the the sooner that we've built a good team around us and the better we've been. So mm. sometimes it takes a couple steps backwards, whether it's it's the bottom line of a company or whether it's your, you know, your time and training someone or something like that to take four or five big steps forward. And the sooner that I figured out or could see the fact that surrounding myself with a better team the you know the benefits were exponential after that at first it was like well i i'll just do it myself right it's going to take too long to go tell this person how to do it or sure. that person how to do it but as soon as we begin to to look at that and and create and compartmentalize the roles and things like that like that was a, a game changer for sure. um for us um in terms of our business and our structure and yeah. and our reach and and our quality of life and and everything else that comes along with with you know the other side of things so was that something that happened relatively recently or is that something that happened years ago? Uh, no, it pro uh, I would say somewhere in the middle as we were going through different ownership structure changes, we had to sort of figure out, okay, you know, with this next group that's coming through or the next people, you know, what their roles are going to be. And then as you began to look, you know, you get doing what you're doing and you, you get up, you do it, you get done, repeat. Right. right. And you have to almost pause and look at things you know, from a, from a 10,000 foot view and, and, and that takes a little bit of time out of the normal grind. And I don't, I oftentimes, unless you're forced to do that, you don't take and, and look at that perspective. Maybe you have an annual planning meeting or maybe you work with a coach or something like that where, where there's value in, in that perspective, but a lot of people don't. And so when right. we had to go through those ownership structure changes, we had to go, okay, well, now that, now that we're losing this person or gaining this person, what does that mean for who does what and how we do it? And, and then all of a sudden that began to open up the door to, okay, you know, maybe the structure that was being used for the last 10 years isn't the structure that gets, should take us to the next level. Sure, That's fair. What got us here won't get us there kind of thing. That makes sense. Is it right. tough with the partners that you have to put together systems like you're talking about? Or do you guys mostly agree or like, how do you get together and put systems like that together? Um, it, it so far, I mean, I can think of maybe one major disagreement that, you know, I've had with the current ownership group. And I guess, you know, the benefit to being the lead owner is that I get to make that final decision. <laughs> uh, you know, so opinion, it's, right? uh, yeah, it's a, it's a democratic dictatorship, I guess. Sure. Uh, but, you know, I think we have good, good discussion and, and we don't let anything fester and we, we've got a good um, way I think of bringing things up. And once again, going back to the the core views and culture of the people that we've hired and that I work with, we are all pointing in the same direction. And so, um, you know, thankfully I haven't been in a situation where, you know, we, we've had too much of that sort of disagreement. Sure. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, the, the buck stops here in a lot of regards um, with me in terms of 
liability and in terms of, of overall direction and in terms of, you know, our employees and their and their families and the decisions sure. that we make that impact them and, and our clients clearly. So mm-hmm. um, so it it's a lot of weight, but I, I try to, you know, I I feel like it's being spread around our team really well. Um, so hopefully we can continue that synergy for some time. Right. That's fair. That's cool. That's very cool. Can you tell me, you mentioned that you have quite a few locations, it sounds like. I'm trying to think of a number of it. Was it six, seven, something like that? Well, uh, we've, uh, well, now that everybody works from their house, if you count that, um, <laughs> no, <we've, laughs> we got like 12 locations. Yeah. Now we've, we've got a Madison East location uh, off of Felland Road, kind of over by um, the East Town Mall over there. Um, and some of the, some of that area off almost towards in Sun Prairie. Um, that's our newest location. We, we ran out of room. Our main office is on the corner of Seminole highway in the Beltline. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's, uh, it's a converted house that they converted into an office building. And we just, we ran out of seats as we were growing. So we had oh, a, wow. ex, yeah, we had to expand and that's why we, we went to, um, to the East side to, to have a presence over there. We, we took over for a retiring advisor a few years back in Horicon. Um, so there's a, a, a little presence, kind of an, an office setting in that community. And then uh, Brandon is originally from Belmont, and he has an office where we can see people down in Platteville, which is near Belmont. So um, so that, that kind of stretches us across, uh, you know, the state and sort of a diagonal yeah. path. Right. Super cool. Is it tough to manage the different offices like that or? Um, you know, we're, uh, we've, we doubled down on technology probably 10 years or so ago and went to being a, um, almost entirely paperless office before that was really a thing. Um, and it took a lot of work and it's been sort of, you know, you can now do that much more affordably than you could 10 years ago, um, in terms of, of storage and, and security and, and all that type of stuff. So it, it, that's gotten better, but we've, we've been doing that for a while. So it helps that. And even through this most recent COVID situation where we've got, you know, some employees that are working from their, from their kitchen table, um, you know, everything is, is within a, a laptop's reach, if you will. Right. And right. all of our, you know, our, our uh, phone systems are voice over IP. So we can, you know, you can reach us anywhere. Yeah, Jackie works from her house. Uh, my other partner, she works from her house in Minnesota because she wants to, oh, she needs nice. to be near family up there. Sure. So no, no one knows that she's sitting in the Twin Cities most days, um, you know, and the rest of us are here in Madison. So sure. um, we, we've adapted pretty well uh, from that regard. And, and thankfully that's made this whole sort of virtual environment that we're living in right now temporarily um, pretty a pretty smooth transition uh sure. not one that we want to keep doing for a while uh yeah. but at least we're, we're able to make a quick you know transition and hopefully get a quick transition back on the other side right that's fair that's totally fair that's actually pretty smart this gives you some a uh, way to i don't know it's like a reserve generator kind of thing that you can always fall back on something if things really go awry like yeah well and you know yeah, and I mean, let's face it. Just like uh, other people who want to to travel and and you know work remotely or or you know spend a a week in you know in somewhere warmer than Wisconsin, um, right. you know, we we were able to do some of those types of things too. And and hopefully the clients and and our our team, you know, don't feel any sort of decrease in that if we sure. want to continue to work. Now, sure. granted, if we leave town, hopefully we're uh, we're actually enjoying ourselves a little bit too. But yes, that's um, cool, right. But that's the balance, right? Yeah. So <laughs> fair, fair. What do you see for the future of Midwest Financial Group in the next, let's call it five years? Um, I would expect that we'll we'll bring on, you know, maybe uh, maybe one, maybe two more advisors as we grow because we, we've really we've had great organic growth. Um, I think the the story and the messaging and and the you know the idea of having a plan the behavioral coaching. Um, I think that when, when a, a person gets a chance to sit down and talk to us about how maybe we're a little bit different than what their preconceived notion is, if they even have one, um, it's really resonated really well. Um, sure. so, so we've had good growth. And I think that because of that, we'll have to probably, you know, five by five years from now, I would imagine that we've, we've either merged with another business and brought them in because there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a, most of my industry, I think the average age is like 57 to 60 years old. I mean, is so most really? of the industries, 
Yeah, they're 20 years older than I am. So oh, as so those people retire, retire yeah, yeah, there, there's a lot of businesses that we look at transition, and and I don't want to. I don't want us to grow to the point where we can't continue the services and the quality of service that we have right now, but we could, sure. you know, I'd like to get a little bit uh, bigger before we sort of just tap that off. So I would imagine that, that we'll, we'll have a couple more staff here and um, I'd love to have a, a, a CPA on staff. You know, right now we work great with, with local um, tax repairs, but it'd be wonderful to have one in house. Sure. You know, there, there's, there's different things like that where I think if we could really become a, a one-stop shop for most things um, right. that our clients would love that. But in the meantime, it's, you know, we've got, like I said, great relationships with, with either pre-existing people that clients work with or, or referral sources that we like. So, um, but there, we're still growing. Uh, one of the things I learned really early on with, with Mark was, you know, if you become complacent, you're, you're shrinking. So, yes you, you kind of have to continue to, to grow and that's not to sound greedy. That's just because that's, it, it, you know, you're either thriving or you're declining. And, and yes. so um, we're going to try to have a controlled growth path so that, you know, the growing pains that come with that aren't experienced by our clients, but I do expect us to grow. Sure. That's fair. No, I always tell people business is like a tree, man. You're either growing or you're dying. <laughs> yep. It's in true. Towards, uh, in towards growth. Um, yeah. How can people find you? You guys have a website or phone number or? Yep. Yeah. So uh, the website is um, mfgteam.com. So Midwest Financial Group, the acronym MFG and then team.com. Um, all of our, our emails, our contact information on there, the, the number for the Madison office, which, which pipes you in and can get you to anybody um, is 608-807-807. Four seven seven five. A lot of great, a lot of good content on the website. Constantly getting updated. Um, you can read bios about our team and and you know uh, different accolades and levels of knowledge and experience and all that type of stuff. And I think it does a really good job conveying the the culture of things here. Um, and you know, for if there's anybody that's listening, that's that's trying to 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 think of this area of the world for work. I mean, we've had interns, we've, you know, we're, we're always looking to bring on the right person. We're in no rush to hire, but if, if the right person comes along, there's always sure. room to bring on a good employee. So, you know, there's, there's even some job postings on there and some different things like that. Nice. Um, so, so yeah. Yep. Super cool. Well, awesome. Well, Matt, I appreciate you being on here. This has been, um, it's been a lot of fun. It's been enlightening. So, uh, well, I'm, I'm happy to be your, your, your first virtual uh, interview here. So, you know, glad to, yeah. to, to make history with you, James. <laughs> yeah, right. This is, I think this is going to be the first Authentic Business Adventures podcast video that was actually a moving picture instead of just a still <laughs> frame with, with audio. So we're up to 2020 here when moving pictures are a thing. I guess. See, there you go. It's, so, it's, it's, it's on the unintended consequences from all this, right? <laughs> right? It's, they're not all bad. Wait, no, no, no. That's fair. That's fair. I still prefer in person, so we'll figure that out. But I yeah, for it. sure. I look forward to that. This has been Authentic Business Adventures, the business program that brings you the struggle stories and triumphant successes of business owners across the land. Coming to you remotely, not from the Sun Prairie Community Studios, underwritten by Bank of Sun Prairie. If you're listening to this on the web, please like, subscribe, and share. My name is James Kateman and Authentic Business Adventures is brought to you by Calls on Call, offering call answering and receptionist services for small businesses across the country on the web at callsoncall.com, as well as Draw in Customers Business Coaching, offering business coaching services for entrepreneurs in all stages of their business on the web at drawincustomers.com. And of course, the Bold Business Book, a book for the entrepreneur in all of us, available on Amazon and wherever fine books are sold. We'd like to thank you, our wonderful listeners, as well as our guest, Matt Couplin, president and CEO of Midwest Financial Group. Matt, can you tell us that website one more time? Yeah, please come uh, check us out. We are at www.mfgteam.com. MFG, that's mother super good. <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyway, we'll let that acronym go. Find us there on 103.5 Wednesdays at 1 p.m., Sundays at 2 p.m., as well as at sunprayemediacenter.com. Past episodes can be found morning, noon, and night at the podcast link on at drawincustomers.com. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next week. I want you to stay awesome. And of course, if you do nothing else, enjoy your business. 